Good morning. Welcome to our panel discussion on technology and finance. Uh, we've got a very uh, uh, lively discussion this morning for you um, around the uh, developments uh, that technology is bringing for the financial sector. Uh, I'm John Armour. I'm Professor of Law and Finance here in the Law Faculty and Academic Director of the MSc in Law and Finance, which is a programme we've been running for eight years. It's run jointly with the Business School. We take uh, students with a law background uh, and we introduce them to concepts in economics and finance, which they can then uh, put to good use uh, either in legal practice in the financial sector uh, or uh, running their own businesses uh, as entrepreneurs. Before we start, I'd like to say a big thanks to the uh, MLF office, to Joanna McKenna, Michael Collier, and Claire Oxenbury, who put this panel together. And I'd like also to say a little bit about what we mean by technology. Uh, so technology and finance have long been interlinked. Technological uh, innovation has been a stimulation for new types of finance from the railways in the 19th century, which stimulated the limited liability company. Uh, electricity in the 1920s and 30s, which were associated with the development of widely held uh, share ownership in the United States. So technology um, in the real economy generates demand for finance. Technology is also uh, uh, something that the financial sector is keen to uh, latch onto, um, and always uh, financial uh, institutions have been early adopters of technology, uh, right back to the New York Stock Exchange's adoption of the telegraph, uh, in the late 19th century, which facilitated the ticker tape uh, and the birth of efficient capital markets. When we're talking about technology today, we're going to pick up, uh, we're going to narrow our focus to three um, very salient or very hot topics. We're going to talk about uh, cryptocurrencies, blockchain, and uh, AI and machine learning. Uh, and uh, our panelists are going to say uh, a little bit to explain uh, the background of some of these um, concepts for those of you who are not familiar with them. Um, to begin with, I'll just say a little bit about what we mean by AI. Um, by AI, artificial intelligence, uh, we mean essentially uh, the uh, uh, use of massive amounts of data with uh, relatively simple algorithms to induce from those data predictions uh, about what's going to happen. Um, and this, this technology uh, is now widely used, spurred by the uh, 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 availability of massive data sets and uh, computer power, uh, and it's being adopted in a number of uh, areas uh, in the financial sector, uh, including uh, uh, so-called robo-advisors, which provide uh, uh, investors with uh, automatic uh, advice. So let me introduce our first uh, panelist. Uh, on my right, TJ Saw. TJ is a graduate of the MLF program. Uh, he's an entrepreneur. He's a computer scientist. He's done two startups, uh, and he's currently uh, the first of which he did while he was a student here at Oxford. Uh, he's worked uh, in the blockchain sector for a number of years, and today he is uh, working at Palantir Technologies, uh, who specialize uh, in the delivery of systems for the management of, uh, of, of massive volumes of data uh, with critical uh, security. Uh, TJ, um, would you like to tell us a little bit about how blockchain works and what uh, an engineer's perspective is uh, on, on this technology and how it's impacting the financial sector? Yeah, I'll, I'll be glad to. So um, I guess, so my qualifications to speak about blockchain would be that I was involved in the creation of the Ethereum protocol, which is um, one of the main uh, blockchain protocols out there. And so uh, right now I'm obviously at Palantir, but I don't speak for the company. Um, in, in terms of what uh, blockchain is on a very high level, just to explain to the crowd, um, to give you a general understanding and flavor of this new technology. Uh, blockchain is actually a suite of technologies that have been around since the 1970s. So these are things such as uh, cryptography, database technologies, um, and networking. So these technologies have been around uh, for quite a while, since the 1970s really. And the reason why they have been bought, brought into the forefront is due to the um, reorganization of these technologies in a way which has an impact on the social and economic value. So it's sort of like a social economic innovation rather than a technological innovation per se. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, so what, what is the blockchain? So on a very high level, it, um, if you think about what the blockchain does, so the technology side of it, uh, my colleague Lisa will talk about the cryptocurrency part of it, but on the technology side uh, part of it, 
it is essentially, um, you can think about it like a database to simplify it. And the issue with a database, if I transfer data to John, for example, um, the data now has, um, has two copies, one with me and one with John. So is there some way for you to like, ensure that there is data scarcity? So this concept of um, ensuring that you know, when you transfer data from one person to another, only one person has the, you know, that data. So you, you, you do it by taking that data so, um, and ensuring that every single one of the individuals has a copy of that data, a copy of the database. So you do it by replicating um, the database on every single individual, on every single node. And when you do this, you basically have a situation where every single person can verify the entire database themselves. Okay, so this is like what it tries to do, like in terms of like a database side of things, why it's different. And once you have this, you have this magical thing in economics, you have scarcity. So once you have scarcity, you can do many amazing things. You can now create markets around it and you can have a lot of interesting things because if I take data and I transfer it to John, the data is no longer mine per se, but the unique copy is now given to John in this data set. So blockchains, um, there are many instantiations of it. It's a class of technologies. Um, the most simple one, the, the technology that underlies uh, Bitcoin, for example, you can think of it like an Excel spreadsheet, you know, a Google spreadsheet that you can just, that has two columns, a key and value pair, and you can just increment or decrement uh, the values associated with an account. So that's all you can do. It's a very simple case. That's a Bitcoin blockchain technology. And then you have different kinds of technology. So Alan Turing from this wonderful country, you know, he, he advanced computer science uh, forward by a lot. And there is this concept of the computer, the state machine. So a computer can be thought of like a chessboard where you can actually reorganize the entire state of the chessboard each time. So you can think of the computer like a state machine. And so you can have even the most advanced uh, kind of computer in this database where you can have arbitrary, arbitrary states being recorded in this database. So you can have um, programs that now execute themselves. So you don't have a database on a, in the distributed way, but you have a computer that is distributed that will execute uh, like your chessboard, you know, you know, uh, uh, queen to e5, you know, it will do these things, this execution of steps in the very particular order. So in terms of technology, what, why is it interesting? So if you think about like, you know, we have the cost theory of the firm, you know, like this theories of the firm, what a firm is, you can think of a corporation or even a law firm as a cybernetic organization, okay? So you have people or as leaves on the end of the node, and they're all writing data back to a database in the organization, okay? So you have this structure going on in most corporations nowadays, most Fortune 500s, they are basically cybernetic organizations. And when you think about it that way, what blockchain is trying to allow you to do is to restructure this cybernetic organization in a way where you can reallocate certain things. So that's, that's why it's interesting. It's able, you are able to now restructure certain things in the social economic sphere. So that's the, a very brief um, <laughs> overview of like the blockchain technology and um, I guess uh, really excited to, to talk about it. Like, uh, and I'll, I guess I'll pass it back to John. Thank, thanks TJ, that was, that was in incredibly uh, illuminating. Um, our, our next panelist uh, is Lisa Raab. Uh, Lisa is a member of the uh, MLF Advisory Board um, and she is uh, someone who has a, a deep background in finance and in uh, fintech. Uh, so she worked for many years at Goldman Sachs as uh, head of uh, public policy and then at Credit Suisse uh, in a similar role. Uh, more recently, uh, she set up her own consultancy, Stratosphere um, Advisors, uh, and she has a, a reg tech, uh, or regulation technology uh, uh, firm, uh, uh, Stratosphere uh, Analytics. Uh, and her advisory work focuses on uh, technology and finance, regulation, uh, and uh, 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 fintech. And she's going to give us um, uh, some insights into uh, 
uh, the perspectives of businesses using technology uh, in the financial sector uh, and regulators' perspectives on uh, technology. And in particular, she's also going to say something about uh, cryptocurrencies, which are a key uh, 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 topic uh, of uh, excitement uh, in the financial sector at the moment. Lisa. <clears throat> Great. Thanks, John. So quick question, show of hands. How many of you in the audience actually have a cryptocurrency wallet? How many have? Okay. I'm sensing a tendency toward a younger demographic, perhaps. Um, I'm sure many of you have uh, thought about it anyway. Should I have one? Because there's been such an enormous hype cycle around cryptocurrencies. You know, they get referred to confusingly sometimes as cryptocurrencies, crypto assets, and some less kind terms as well. So there's a lot of kind of um, crypto mania going on out there. So let me see if I can decrypt some of this for you. So um, the digital and crypto natives are very keen adopters of cryptocurrency, as we've seen you know, from the demographic in the, in the audience. Why is this? They think of it as a logical extension of the freedoms of information that we've been able to derive and enjoy and, and benefit from as a result of the internet and the data revolution. So they see this as an extension of that freedom to access data for productive use to freedom to transact in an unfettered way at low cost without intermediaries and most critically anonymously. So one of the elements of cryptocurrency that makes it unique and special is the anonymity of the uh, transactors and the ability to kind of just tr have an absolutely certain transaction without having to be open and public about the identity of the transactors. So where did this all come from? Um, there are, by the way, thousands of crypto cryptocurrencies out there. The top three are Bitcoin, Ether, and XRP. Top three, I mean, not in a judgy way, but just those are in terms of size and scale and, and levels of adoption. Um, there are uh, some that have been proven to be Ponzi schemes. So it makes it very easy for people to sort of write them off as this is crypto craziness and it's all going to go away. It's a fad. In fact, um, at the Eurofee conference two weeks ago, there was a, an opinion poll done on cryptocurrencies. And this was an expert audience of the financial sector, all the finance ministries from around Europe and financial regulators. And of that poll, the vast majority of people either dismissed it as outright a fad or said that it doesn't really have any concrete use cases in and, and enterprise value. There were uh, a core of people, though, I'd say about, I think it was something like 14 to 15 percent, who did see enterprise use cases for crypto. And we'll get into that and talk more about it. But first, let me help you a little bit with the origins of this. Um, so the crypto anarchist wing of crypto want crypto to actually replace or even overthrow the fractional reserve banking system. So consequently, it's not surprising that some of the central banks are a little cranky about cryptocurrencies and a little sensitive. Um, so the most conservative commentary that you tend to see comes from central banks who run the monetary policy, the fiat currency systems that we, that we know. So 10 years ago, um, a character uh, called Satoshi Nakamura wrote a white paper in October 2008, almost exactly 10 years ago, called Bitcoin a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. So that, I think, gives you a baseline of what it is, peer-to-peer -peer cash transaction system. The context is fascinating. Today is the 10th anniversary of the Lehman crisis and the financial crisis more broadly. But today was the day that Lehman Brothers went bankrupt. And I remember that day very, very vividly. Um, the, the, the bailout, the cost of it is all well known. I'm sure you've seen lots of articles about this. But for me, one of the fascinating things that hasn't been brought out is the relevance of the financial crisis to the launch of Bitcoin, the first cryptocurrency. So um, Satoshi created the Genesis block, which is the first block in the blockchain that created the first cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, in, on the 3rd of January 2009. He released the white paper in October to lay the groundwork, and he actually got released the first block, 3rd of Jan 2009. Fascinatingly, embedded in the Coinbase transaction is text that reads as follows. The Times, 3rd of January 2009, Chancellor on brink of second bailout for banks. That gives you a big clue to Satoshi's motivations and I, the ideas behind this. Uh, so he didn't actually create it as a result of the financial crisis. He was working on it before the crisis happened. But it does give you an insight into the mindset of the creator. And this, this um, 
this comment is widely interpreted as a derisive commentary on the unstable nature of the fractional reserve banking system and that we needed to do something about this. And I think the financial crisis lit the touch paper under that and said, gosh, banks, commercial banks, retail banks are unstable. Central banks, can they control everything and, and get a grip on things? And you know, where we've gone from there is very evident. Following the financial crisis, the banks have retreated from retail. We've got all the high street branch closures. They've gone from universal global to national local level. Um, and so that, you could argue, is reinforcement for the fact that a lot of people want to see a change in the system. So that helps to understand the mentality that's driven, the mania almost, um, be behind cryptocurrencies. So Bitcoin started with financial transactions. And the underlier of Bitcoin uh, and blockchain is cryptography. And the fans claim that blockchain and cryptocurrencies provide not only an immutable transaction record, but it's unhackable. So that brings another level of understanding to why people are excited about this stuff. Unhackability. We have all kinds of marvelous technology proliferating, but we all know about cybersecurity risk, which is now a board level problem and something that we all live with in our daily lives every time our credit card um, data gets stolen. So crypto assets themselves, there are lock keys in the blockchain and they're order dependent. The computing of a crypto asset, each, requires, each block requires a lot of computing power to um, be able, so why do people claim it's unhackable? Because you would have to take over the entirety of the blockchain and the computations which are massive that underline every block in the chain. So the generation of the lock key is super intensive. And that brings us to one of the criticisms of cryptocurrency, the environmental and computational power and cost of, of doing it, um, of some of it. There the are different types of blockchains. People refer to it like it's all one. There are different blockchains. Um, the validation of the blocks is faster, but the generation is super, super computationally intensive. And as TJ explained, these lock key pay pairs are dependent on the blocks before and after. And that's what makes it all kind of linked together in an unhackable way. Um, so the calculation of the hashes in between the blocks is what gets referred to as mining. You've probably heard about crypto mining, crypto asset, cryptocurrency mining. Um, that's the process that the nodes, the different computers in the blockchain do in order to verify the computational integrity of the blocks. And they get rewarded for that, this is the currency piece, with whatever the coin is. So if you're a Bitcoin miner, you get Bitcoins for performing this complex computational energy intensive process. So that's how the coins are created and proliferate. Now, on the one hand, yes, every node, um, and, and, and sorry, the other thing is every computer and node on the blockchain keeps a copy of the full blockchain. So there are vast number of copies. If somebody tried to hack it, there would be a record on all the other computers in the node that would enable you to say, no, this attempt to change the blockchain is invalid. So that's, again, to help you understand why people think it's unhackable. It is vulnerable to a 51% attack. If somebody could control 51% of the blockchain, you could get a majority of the nodes to agree on an alteration of, of the blockchain. So it's theoretically, there's a, but it, to do that would be extremely difficult. And you know, TJ as an engineer can probably shed more light later on why that is so. Um, so let me just talk briefly about a couple of the, the issues and concerns with crypto. So the advantage of it is the ability to use it as a transmission mechanism that is very secure and anonymous. And so, for example, it could be used to transact from a less liquid fiat currency to another less liquid fiat currency. So it's, it's not just a currency in its own right. It can be used to transfer value and to transfer value in a more rapid way than the payment system today allows us to. So um, the heart of uh, XRP, for example, and Ripple's payment system is to be able to exchange, let's say, Nigerian and Malaysian currencies by passing them through XRP rather than having to go through a reserve currency like the dollar. The payments process to transact less liquid currencies around the world is extremely slow and extremely expensive. So one use case for crypto is to use it as not a reserve currency, but a transfer currency 
to speed up transactions in emerging market countries around the world in emerging market currencies, for example. So what are the concerns? So who does actually, if anyone, have the potential to control or direct crypto? Decentralized cryptocurrencies, in theory, nobody does, um, although there's the 51% hypothetical. Um, but there are also what are called permissioned blockchains. And we can get into this a little bit more as we start talking about the use case. Permissioned blockchains, instead of being open source and decentralized with potentially millions of computer nodes involved in the computation of the blockchain, have a group of people, like almost like a board, that are in charge of them. Okay, so when people talk about blockchain, blockchain, there are different types. So, so with that, you could see that there's a group of people who can control the blockchain. <laughs> Um, secondly, systemic risk and monetary policy impacts. Pro huge proliferation of reports from uh, the G20, the Financial Stability Board, various national central banks and regulators studying, are cryptocurrencies becoming big enough at this point to have an impact on the traditional monetary system or cause any systemic risk? At the moment, the view is no, they don't, but, but everybody's watching very closely to see what size and scale they, they gain over time. Third one, speculative bubble retail investor losses. So uh, one thing the regulators do agree on is that they don't want retail individuals speculating in cryptocurrencies. Um, and they're worried that this could cause significant retail investor losses and cause a big <coughs> reputational backlash um, similar to other bubbles and crises we've seen. Fourth one is environmental impact and cost. The sheer environmental uh, impact of the computational power. So um, the computational power for Bitcoin has been compared to the amount of energy that Austria as a country consumes. So a lot of people are concerned about the environmental impact of that. Uh, computational integrity insurance is, you know, uh, the decentralized versus permissioned. There's no central authority or value backing the crypto asset is one of the arguments that people put against it to say it's not a real currency, it's, it's something else. And then latency and reliability is an issue for use case for commercialization of cryptocurrency. Bitcoin can be 10 minutes or less or more, so you don't have a reliable level of uh, transaction time. So that matters for things like securities transactions where it can be millions of transactions per second. The latency is too slow to use it for anything like that. Um, and then there's the claims of unhackability and you know, can we really rely on that? So we'll talk more about whether crypto is starting to go mainstream. There are signs of that. Um, Bloomberg's Galaxy Crypto Index. Uh, you know, Bloomberg has set up an index around, around cryptocurrencies. There are companies as staid and traditional as Northern Trust in the United States coming into the custody and storage solution provision business for cryptocurrencies. There are broker-dealer functions like market making now emerging around cryptocurrency. And regulated crypto asset exchanges are starting to set up and proliferate and seek regulatory licenses and authorizations from financial regulators, posing a bit of a conundrum for those regulators as to whether or not they want to validate uh, the cryptocurrencies by allowing a regulated exchange to help people transact safely. So there are a lot of really interesting questions emerging around the use cases and around regulators' attitudes to and willingness to either facilitate or uh, get in the way of cryptocurrencies. So I'll pause it there. That's probably enough information for you all to be dangerous with, and hopefully that was reasonably clear. Thank you, Lisa. That was, that was really, really helpful. Um, oh, and I'm sorry, I forgot to mention, congratulate John on his prescience in picking this date to have this topic of <laughs> technology and finance. So thank you, the Lehman crisis date. You, you picked this, this very well. Well done, John. Th thanks, Lisa. Uh, our third um, panelist is Alessandra Solberger. Uh, she's also a graduate of the MLF program and uh, a member now of our advisory board. Um, Alessandra's uh, got a background uh, in private equity and venture capital. Uh, she worked at uh, Blackstone uh, for a number of years uh, and then at Mosaic Ventures. Uh, but since then, she's branched out on her own. She now runs her own um, healthcare product company. Um, Evermore Health, um, but she also continues to invest uh, and has made a number of investments and gives advice to uh, companies uh, using blockchain technologies. Um, so Alessandra is going to uh, give us some observations from the perspective of an investor uh, in this sector. Uh, so Alessandra, what do you look out for uh, making investments uh, in, in technology? Yeah. So I'd like to start with the fact that most of the use cases that you might be hearing about out there, you might be reading press about, like exciting ways to apply the blockchain, 
are absolute nonsense. 90% of what you read is useless, right? And, uh, and there's a number of reasons for that, and it's normal when a technology is actually so promising, but causes all the hype that we've been witnessing. Um, I had, for instance, like two weeks ago, this very famous art uh, photographer in London telling me, if only I could track the pictures that get spread around Instagram uh, from, from my own work, my own paid work, through the blockchain. And I stopped for a second, I was like, why do you need the blockchain for this? Because a lot of these applications that people tend to think, oh, we might want to track it on the blockchain, let's put it on it, let's use that ledger, are actually easily feasible without the blockchain. They actually are easily um, sort of like translatable to normal databases. Uh, and this is what I like to say because my main assumption always is the blockchain is the worst database solution you could possibly make unless. And the unless contains a very narrow, very small, but incredibly valuable um, applications and then kind of like use case areas. Uh, we need to take it back to the killer application here. And the killer app, as we like to call it in uh, investment terms, uh, in this space is censorship resistance. And that means that effectively um, getting that anonymity that as TJ um, and, uh, and Lisa explained are, are guaranteed by the way the blockchain works. So effectively that trust replacement mechanism is incredibly valuable uh, for a number of industries. Now, it's often not that corporate friendly um, because again, in the corporate world, I see the same problem. Um, I have uh, a colleague who's also an investor who told me uh, he's working with a very famous pharma company, uh, one of the biggest in the world, uh, to put their R&D supply chain on the blockchain. So then again, I asked a few questions and uh, I got to the point, like, do they actually need the blockchain for this? Uh, and he admitted that they don't, but it sounds really fancy and everybody has what, again, in the investor world we call FOMO, which is the fear of missing out on the blockchain. Um, now, when I look at different sectors, um, and I recently wrote an article about uh, health records. So in healthcare, putting the health records of patients on the blockchain, um, that's interesting to me. Uh, it's a different area than uh, maybe like most of the, the ones that we're used to think of uh, in blockchain or in cryptocurrencies, uh, because it involves data effectively. Now, when it comes to data, uh, blockchains, once again, are usually the worst solution you can find because they're slow, they're not scalable at the moment, and they're not scalable because the trade-off of putting something, as Lisa explained, uh, on all the computers in the world or all the computers of the participants in a specific network means that it's extremely slow, right? Because it needs to be recorded if we are all part of a specific blockchain network, it needs to be recorded on all of your computers, on my computer, and then it finally works and it's, uh, you know, it has all the features that are so valuable about it. Uh, and so when it comes to data, that's particularly problematic because if you're handling millions of data, uh, you need a certain speed, uh, you need a certain resilience in the system. Um, blockchains per se um, are, are very tricky to use for that. There's a few solutions around that uh, and I'd like to mention to you something uh, that uh, you, you might want to keep in mind uh, because I think in the coming years it will become an increasing sort of like an increasingly important topic which is that actually blockchains are just one type of decentralized ledgers. So decentralized ledgers have the characteristics that we've been talking about but they can actually be built in different ways. Um, so there's another category, uh, just to throw one quick word in there, it's called acyclical graphs. All you need to remember is that they're much faster, uh, they don't necessarily have all the properties of a blockchain, uh, it's a compromise, uh, but for data handling, uh, they might be much better. And so when I look at a sector like healthcare, uh, and I look at areas like uh, tracking the supply chain in a transparent way, uh, why would that be interesting with the blockchain? I think it's interesting because of microtransactions. Microtransactions are another sort of like killer application uh, of the blockchain in the sense that it's never been economically viable to record each tiny microtransaction is in 0.1 cents or you know, like a very small fraction of money. It's never been economically viable to track all of those tiny transactions to then be able to fully guarantee and fully prove 
um, that, uh, that everything has been recorded. Like the whole supply chain is trackable. It's never been economically viable. Now, blockchain systems can make that viable. And that's very interesting. But then again, not all industries, in fact, only a few, a few kind of like areas and a few industries have that actual need in their supply chains. And so I've analyzed several of them. And I think that uh, in healthcare, for instance, there's just a few areas that uh, can be interested in that. Um, and then getting back to health records. Now, I think it's a good example because in the case of health records, let's not fool ourselves. Like the other problem right now is that everybody looks at this through like rose color glasses and thinks that the blockchain is going to save the world and take over every, uh, every sector. Actually, it's very criminal friendly. It is. Let's not fool ourselves, right? The blockchain actually is a, a criminal's dream for a number of uh, applications and features that it's got. And so when you think about health records, we need to be very careful because when you're developing and when you're thinking about a protocol, when you're thinking about a system, you need to keep in mind the governance. Governance of protocols is an area I find extremely fascinating. Why is that? Because every protocol is effectively like building a little country. So you're building a country where there is a monetary policy in place. There's a kind of like a central bank that issues these currencies, like cryptocurrencies. And we can talk about that because there's many, many different types of cryptocurrencies or crypto assets, actually. Um, and then you need to build incentives into the system for the system to run itself just like capitalism, a decentralized market economy, runs the participants in a very different way than a centralized one like uh, a communist uh, system would dictate how um, you know, players or us uh, interact in that ecosystem. So that I find extremely fascinating because we've never had that kind of innovation and the kind of rapid iteration for effectively systems that can then permeate into society and into politics. And as we see from the headlines this morning, and as we know in general, uh, in this country, in the US and in many others, it'd be great if actually uh, our systems uh, and, our, and our politics could learn a little bit and, and benefit from the innovation that is happening in these protocols. Um, and so getting back to health records, uh, bringing you back to that, um, what I think is interesting in an example like that um, is it's very important to keep in mind at the moment, at the genesis, when you start thinking about how to build such a protocol, it's very important to keep in mind what the perils are. And the perils in there are that if this is fully transparent, if this is fully trackable, and someone sees that there's um, you know, a potential organ donor with a very rare type of blood, of genetic profile, uh, of uh, any other characteristics that might be important in the future. Uh, the reason I say in the future is because right now healthcare is not quite set up uh, to, to give you such a, a level of detail, but it soon will be, um, which is exciting. So you are going to be able to say, okay, uh, Lisa has a very specific profile, and in this case, is actually relevant uh, to my brother um, who, who needs a transplant. Now, a corrupt third party will try to exploit this in a very different way than an honest third party, right? Uh, and we don't need to go into sort of like um, the dark side of that industry. And so keeping these things in mind and not fooling ourselves about what's actually the, the sort of like dark side of the very bright features that the blockchain enables is very important from a governance perspective uh, because all of these protocols need to keep that in mind. So when I look at projects and when I look at sectors, um, I like to sort of like try to predict the various directions that that sector and that industry and that specific protocol can go into and sort of like take it back to today um, and look at what's important to code into it. Uh, so that's something that I always like to keep in mind with projects. Thanks very much, uh, Alessandra. Um, and our fourth and final panelist uh, is Oren Sussman. Uh, so Oren is a economist, a financial economist uh, in, the, in the Said Business School uh, and a member of the MLF teaching team. He's taught our first principles of financial economics course uh, right from the start of the program. It's an integral uh, part of the program. Um, and his interests are wide ranging, but uh, center, I suppose, on uh, the role of debt. Uh, so debt uh, in the macro economy, debt in the business cycle, debt in the financing of firms, uh, and uh, the legal aspects of debt in insolvency. Um, Oren, you're going to give us a, an academic's perspective on these uh, these technological developments. Okay, so uh, I, I I would like to make uh, one point. I mean, there are many uh, uh, 
points that one can make on technology and economics, but I wanted to focus on one of them. And I would like to uh, try and deliver the point uh, through a, a series of examples. So I will not talk about something so sophisticated as, as TJ or, or Alessandra. I, 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 I will start with something very, very basic, and this is the London taxi market. So uh, probably everyone in this room knows that the uh, London taxi market has two tiers. There are the black cabbies and there are the upper tier of the market. There are, uh, the cars are more uh, fancy. The drivers are supposed to be uh, better certified. Uh, I looked up the TFL website and they say that the exams for cabbies in London are the most difficult in the world. So. Uh, it's supposed to be uh, the up part of the market, but economically something that is very important is that black cabbies are allowed to, to collect passengers on the street. Then there's the lower tier uh, uh, of the market, which is the minicabs, uh, traditionally organized in small stations around, uh, uh, around tube stations. So the idea is that uh, you, you take the tube up to a point and from there on you can go to a, a, a minicab station and ask for a, a, a minicab because minicabs are not allowed to pick passengers on, on the street. You can uh, pick them in a station or you can call them and uh, they will come to take you. Uh, the drivers typically uh, come from the worst places in the world, uh, like I like to use Swiss cottage uh, minicabs. Uh, they are dominated by Afghanis, but some stations have many Somalis or Congolese. And, and if you are interested in the dark side of humanity, talk to those uh, there's people. They have a lot of <coughs> stories to tell. Anyway, around 2011, uh, Uber comes on the scene. And many people, uh, including myself, thought that the minicab market is finished. Who uh, will be able to compete with this wonderful thing, which is techy, which is chic, uh, which is smart, and be honest, very, very convenient. We all have mobile phones. It's very, very convenient to call a, a minicab by a, a, a press of the button. So I thought, uh, like many others, that the minicabs are finished and the black cabs are uh, going to suffer a very, very substantial decrease in size. But uh, then something very interesting happened, that the small uh, minicab stations have realized that uh, in order to uh, compete with Uber, they have to increase size. And a wave of mergers, not the kind of mergers that you read about in the Financial Times, but if you talk to the drivers, they will tell you that they have started to make deals with other stations. And the objective was to uh, reach a critical size that will allow them to buy some uh, technology that looks like, uh, like Uber. And uh, in the last year, uh, they have achieved this goal. And uh, there are all sorts of, of, of apps now. I use iRide, which I actually find more convenient than Uber because it is tailor-made for, for Londoners. So what am I trying to tell you? Well, what I'm trying to tell you is that although the technology is, is amazing and uh, already has made profound change uh, or impact on our lives and will make uh, many more impacts, the, uh, the prediction or the, uh, the understanding of where the economic impact is going to come is not that easy. Particularly, it's not the case that the smartest, coolest, uh, uh, most fascinating and smartest technology uh, will actually uh, prevail, and particularly that it will be able to collect the value or, or, or to monetize the value that the technology is, uh, is creating. So, can we say anything more, just that it is unpredictable? Well, I think we can say something more. And the basic point here is to understand that taxi driving is a business that has two parts. It has the operations, which are the actual drivers on the street, and there's the booking system. 
So this is a classic vertical integration story. And the question in vertical integrations is always who will take over whom? Will the booking system take over the operation or whether the operation will take over the booking system? So what do we know as economists about the outcome of a game like that? Well, there's a rule of thumb. And the rule of thumb is that the more uh, specific skill uh, will take over the more generic technology. And, and this is basically what is going on uh, in, in, in the London uh, taxi market, that taxi driving or, or managing a taxi company is a very localized business. It has to do with licensing, it has to do with regulation, and it has to do with a lot of politics, of, of lobbying a local council, city hall for permits, for, uh, um, for insurance arrangement, for all that kind of stuff. At the same time, the technology is becoming generic very, very quickly, which allowed, in this case, the operators to take over the technology rather than the technology to take over the operators. Now, uh, we have to remember as well that there is another possibility, and this is that there are no synergies at all between operations and, and booking. And the best example for that is Booking.com. Booking.com, from the start, uh, didn't try to get into operation. It stayed a booking system for hotels. It is not as big as Uber. It doesn't make headlines as Uber. It doesn't excite as Uber. But it has one small, one small advantage. It actually makes money. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's a company that is listed on NASDAQ already, has a healthy cash flow, has a multiplier which is a bit, a bit higher than average but within, within a reasonable range. It's a normal company. It's a good company. While the future of Uber is still, I think, worldwide, uh, there's a big question mark on whether Uber will make it uh, uh, or not. The, the last point I want to make is that uh, the effect that I'm talking about is generic. It's not something new and uh, uh, it, it didn't start uh, yesterday. And I want to give three examples. And the first one, going back to John, is railroads. So the impact of railroads on the economy is something that economic historians have documented very, very thoroughly. And there's no doubt that railroads have revolutionized the, uh, the economic world of the late 19th century. Nowadays, we, we tend to think about railroads as something big, dirty, old-fashioned, and loss-making. But in, in the old days, it was the coolest thing in town. Now, how many, in this, how many people in this room can remember a name of a single company or a single developer of railroads that actually made a lot of money. Well, I know one because I, I wrote a paper about it, that if I didn't write a paper about it, I wouldn't know even that single one. However, how many people in this room remember the name of JP Morgan? Why? Because he put so many railroads in bankruptcy. So he is the man that had the specific knowledge to use the generic technology in order to make money. The, the second example is Microsoft. So probably at, uh, at the critical days of Microsoft, IBM thought that they are the cool thing. They have the know-how of how to build these wonderful machines that can sit on our desk <coughs> and do all these things. And operating system, this is, this is small stuff, no? It's, and and MS-DOS, to, to whoever remembers, was a horrible stuff. So, who needs to license and who needs to take control over, over the operating system? It was a huge mistake. And it was a huge mistake because it ignored something very, very basic about users, about the value of compatibility across computers. So IBM, the smart, the big, the big labs, the big science, lost to something which is, I guess, you can ask TJ, he's the expert, but it's not exactly the, most, the smartest thing in the world. 
And to go to the uh, last example, I think that uh, um, we, we should credit Elon Musk for uh, energizing and pushing ahead the development of, uh, of electrical cars. Uh, he deserves credit for that. Will he prevail? Well, who knows? But uh, I think it is very, very possible, uh, if not likely, that in 20 years' time we shall have an alumni, alumni event here and no one will remember who Elon Musk was. Uh, again, what's the problem? The problem is that Elon Musk doesn't have any specific knowledge. Everyone can buy batteries from Panasonic and put them on a chassis. And this is even before the giants of Volkswagen and Honda have made the move. So uh, it is entirely possible that at the end of the day they will eat him alive. Thank you, Oren. So we've heard a really fantastic range of perspectives. We've heard how blockchain works, how cryptocurrencies work, um, some of the, uh, some of the uh, really valuable potential use cases, the limits of the use cases, the dark side um, of, uh, of, of blockchain, and then the uh, very subtle and complex and hard to predict uh, aspects of the industrial organization uh, that develop when uh, a new technology is implemented. Um, in a few moments, I'd like to uh, throw the floor open to questions. Uh, so just have a think about what you'd like to ask the panelists. But before we do that, because we're in the law faculty, there's a question I have to ask the panelists, which is um, we've talked about what the attributes of cryptocurrencies and, and blockchain are, and, and really what they, they don't deliver brilliantly on speed. Uh, and speed is something that's generally pretty important in the financial sector. Um, but what they do major on, as we've heard, um, is secure anonymity. Uh, and that's useful uh, for a number of purposes in the financial sector, but often at odds with uh, what regulators are trying to do. So in particular, if we think about uh, regulatory oversight of uh, the identity of people moving large amounts of money around, anti-money laundering, uh, terrorist financing restrictions, um, uh, cryptocurrencies uh, and, and blockchain are um, uh, ideal for somebody who wants to evade these. Um, similarly, what we might be seeing, I'm afraid, in the future is more uh, fragmentation uh, in currency, more currency controls. Um, cryptocurrency might be used uh, as a way of getting around these. Um, so for the panel, what, what do you see as the ways that regulators are responding uh, uh, or should be responding to, to these, uh, this particular uh, point of tension between the use of technology and the goals of uh, regulation? Um, who, who'd like to answer that? I can, Maybe Lisa, yeah. sure, since I, I deal in the world yeah. of, of regulators and regulatory technology. So um, th this is a huge topic. I'll try and give you a few, a, a few key quick takeaways. So regulators are concerned, and they are, there's a, a, a tendency to think regulators are not very technologically sophisticated, and indeed there is a skills gap in the technology market in general. Uh, the, the hiring process right now is at fever pitch for anybody with blockchain knowledge, as, as TJ probably knows. Um, but it's, uh, so, so step one is can the regulators get, do they have a grip on the technology? And therefore, are their instincts to regulate certain elements of it appropriate or, or not? Um, one of the things that's happening is they are looking at uh, the birth of the new platform-based business model. And they're thinking about whether that requires a different approach to regulation. This is happening not only in finance, but in antitrust. One of the most interesting to me uh, public policy debates is about whether we need a different form of control over anti-competitive effects based on platform-based businesses and based on some of these new technologies. And there's a, another professor here at Oxford, Ariel Azraki, who's written a fascinating book on this. There are two books, Big Data and the other one's called Virtual Competition. And Oxford hosted a really good conference on this stuff last year. Q this week, the Federal Trade Commission in the US, the US antitrust authorities have been accused of being asleep at the switch around the, the big tech companies. FTC has announced hearings between now and November looking at all these elements of use of data ability to have a preponderant control over really key data and whether that causes anti-competitive foreclosure of the market for new entrants to come in. So we didn't get as much into the data analytics and kind of predictive analytics and that world and that technology and its potential, but that's part of where the antitrust debate is situating itself. The financial regulatory debate is situating itself around do some of these technologies because of their speed um, and because of their security and very special elements, 
could they give rise to new forms of systemic risk? So that's the debate going on within the central banking community. The financial regulators are still concerned about investor protection, security and safety of the system, and the market infrastructure. So one of the things these technologies, the blockchain, but also some of these predictive analytics are bringing is new market infrastructure. So the old market infrastructure is traditional stock exchanges. The new market infrastructure is algorithms, artificial intelligence, and, and data analytics. So how the regulators can get a grip on that. One of the biggest questions, one of the biggest um, positive use cases is for regulators themselves to be able to use the data, the predictive analytics, <coughs> the blockchain for their own regulatory purposes. So they're all starting to experiment with that in regulatory sandboxes, et cetera. But one of the biggest things that would benefit the whole system is machine readability of regulations themselves. Once we have that, I believe we will see an explosion of application of artificial intelligence in the regulatory sphere, both private sector operators bringing to bear brand new types of um, super uh, regulatory compliance tools and regulatory analytics tools that the AI technology can't quite do efficiently yet. Why? Because the regulation right now is not machine readable. So the UK FCA is at the forefront of the thinking on and is in fact engaged in a project in machine readability. So that's one to watch for the future. But uh, in the meantime, the majority of regulators, there are a few who have banned cryptocurrencies, um, some of the Asian regulators, etc. Um, the mindset in Europe, by and large, and in the United States has been, we don't want to foreclose innovation on blockchain, so we're going to go softly, softly around cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency is one subsegment of blockchain. And one of the interesting elements of cryptocurrency is cryptocurrency itself is fueling some of the investment and development in blockchain, and the regulators don't want to close that off. So that's maybe just a few elements of, of a feel for what's going on out there. But there's been an explosion of regulators' papers on all these different technologies and how they might apply for better or for worse to the financial system. Great. Thank, thank you, Lisa. So now we've got time for uh, some questions from the audience. I think we've got a roving mic. Um, so yes. Um my question is for Lisa. Uh, you gave the healthcare as a suitable use case. Alexandra gave uh, that. For, forgive me, Alexandra, I'm sorry. Uh, you gave healthcare as a, a suitable use case for blockchain. Uh, if you were to generalize that, what are some of the characteristics and attributes of a use case for which blockchain would be a suitable platform? Mm -hmm. So. I would say healthcare as an industry has a range of applications that can be good use cases for the blockchain. Now, it's important to keep in mind that there needs to be <coughs> in most systems, so you know, there's two clusters. Like one is there needs to be a trust issue within the parties. So for instance, like for private companies in a variety of sectors, consortia where you have a middleman extracting a lot or you know, a considerable amount of fees out of effectively offering the function of the trusted third party that settles um, and verifies transactions. When you can replace that with a system where trust is just not needed, obviously you can cut most of those fees and they can be redistributed to the various parties in the consortium. So I've seen that happening in several markets, like commodity markets actually. Um, and that is a feature to keep in mind in general as you think about industries. Uh, is there a trust replacement need? Is there a third party t performing that function? Or is there a sort of like friction caused by the fact that parties cannot transact perfectly in whichever way? And that can be, by the way, within an organization as well. It can be the way an organization communicates uh, within teams, uh, within projects. Um, but wherever there's trust um, at, uh, at question. Uh, so, and that gets back to censorship resistance. And then another one that I would keep in mind is uh, what I mentioned before, microtransactions. So wherever there could be a need, <coughs> and this has been something that in the early days of uh, the internet was very much a discussion as well. Like, can we enable micropayments? Uh, and for a number of reasons that hasn't quite happened in the way that it could happen uh, in blockchain. So I would say, Keeping in mind the trust replacement, censorship resistance side of things in whichever industry you look at, 
and then microtransactions on the other side. Thank you. So, uh, time Can I just add one, one quick point to that? The trust element's really important, and it's important to regulators, and it's part of why there's a big debate about can some of the fintechs and the technology startups, will they be eventually crushed by the incumbents? In the financial, in the regulated industry space, part of the reason for that is regulation enshrines trust through the licensing process of the regulated industry uh, individual companies. So if you think of the intermediaries that Alexandra has been talking about, these intermediaries are all licensed and regulated in the financial sector by financial regulators. So are we, are, do we have enough trust in the replacement technologies like blockchain and data analytics and algorithms that are automated systems to enable those to replace the licensed trusted intermediaries? That's the big gamble on which tech startups and fintech startups have the potential to win and which have the potential to be crushed or, or taken out by the incumbents. So I've got two, two more questions. So let's collect these questions and then we'll have our answers from the panel. So this uh, gentleman, then you're next. Well, my question is about the systemic risk arising from uh, cryptocurrencies and things like Bitcoin in particular. And I've seen Bitcoins being traded with a huge volatility that's there. And in my um, I've always also noticed that the regulators are always behind the curve on this. So my question is, what do you think are the risks in allowing bitcoins and things like, like those to be traded freely? And how good are the regulators likely to be in controlling that? Now, I know that, for example, you know, uh, uh, people have been buying bitcoins on credit cards. And if, of course, if, they, if it goes volatile and they lose money, and it can happen very rapidly, the volatility is huge. Uh, that could obviously cause system uh, problems to the banking system. I know some banks have now stopped it, but I'm just worried that you know, these will go out of hand before it all gets regulated properly, and we're going to end up with another uh, Lehman's on our hands. But remember, Lehman's also happened because all the derivative transactions that were not recorded centrally, it's nothing to do with just the subprime. That was one element of a big picture. Right. I think um, your Lehman analogy is a very useful one to help answer your question. Uh, which is we didn't understand, the, re the reason Lehman was allowed to fail was because the regulators didn't understand the interconnectivity and the consequences of that failure. Could, they could well make the same mistake with cryptocurrency. Because of its anonymity, the, where it is in the system, quote unquote, or, and where it is in people's pockets and enterprise is a, is a big unknown. So it's small enough in scale right now that the regulators believe they're confident that it doesn't pose a massive, by systemic risk, we mean like something that could cause something on the scale of the financial crisis. Can it cause a lot of loss and pain? Absolutely. But uh, the regulators, I think, also, if anything, may be a little bit overconfident that they can just step in when they need to and crush this stuff and just ban it. And I think that's where I get worried because they're waiting right now, as you say, uh, but they are definitely overconfident that they can still step in at the right moment and just turn off the switch. And I'm not convinced if, that they understand yet. And they are, in fact, studying. They're doing a mapping exercise right this very moment. Um, it was discussed at the Eurofee conference uh, last week where they're trying to study where is the cryptocurrency? Who holds it? What's it being used for? All the, all the different ones. And that study is at early stage, but it will be interesting to see if it leads the regulators to a more activist conclusion. And the last thing I'll say is there's also a huge debate raging about what crypto assets are. Are they currency and therefore the preserve of the central banks to regulate? Are they a security? And the securities regulators are all getting excited, the US SEC, et cetera, saying, yes, yes, you know, this, this should be our purview. Are they a commodity? And the CFTC in the US is exerting authority. So there's also a battle zone emerging around the regulators grabbing for turf. They're not immune to turf wars. Anyway, let's, uh, we have other questions, but I hope so that we helps. we have a final question um, uh, uh, here, and the mic, the mic is just coming down. I should just add that the, 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 legal, the legal character of, of cryptocurrency is a very interesting question that people in the faculty are, are currently working on. Yeah. Yes. I, I, I think it's, it's quite interesting to to think of all the positive examples that can be used. But I think sort of the um, the success of it from a society point of view is how do we stop it being used predominantly for financial crime and the financing of t t terrorism. And I'd be interested in your views on sort of how how that how how that how the anonymity of cryptocurrencies in particular uh, can be controlled to to avoid that uh, destabilizing use. So, um, so I, I guess like 
in terms of Bitcoin and Ethereum or the major currencies at least, and including Ripple, it's quite easy to map up on the blockchain what is happening. You can see who's holding the uh, what currency. You may not know who it is, but you can see the wallet address. There are certain other currencies out there like Monero and Zcash, which uses like zero knowledge proof, which like mathematically designed to anonymize things or use a, a mixer basically as part of the core protocol. And these these particular protocols or cryptocurrencies are a bit more problematic because the anonymity, the high level of anonymity is built in as a first class feature to the cryptocurrency. So I think like I think North Korea uses cryptocurrency a lot. When when like when the US banned like the Wikipedia from like uh, you know financing free sits bank accounts, Julian Assange went to like uh, you know do the Bitcoin thing and then he went to publicize on Twitter, thank you so much. Uh, US, you know, for doing this. So I, I think, like, fundamentally, um, from a financial crimes perspective, you can map the thing for the major ones at least. But then there are certain emerging cryptocurrencies. Not really emerging. They've been around for about a year, uh, more than a year actually. And that 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 basically um, says, uh, "Sorry, regulators, I will d mathematically prevent you from like doing this." Yeah, that, that, that gets back to what I referred to as the crypto anarchist wing, those who really want to mask for nefarious reasons. And those there also is another crypto anarchist wing who just believe the system isn't serving us well for a whole bunch of reasons, and therefore a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer system is, uh, is a better way to go. But um, I, I think the, the question of the nefarious purposes is one that's important for everybody in the crypto context. Um, do you as an individual, if you set up a wallet and you're transacting in Bitcoin and Ether, if those are also being used by dark elements for nefarious purposes, are you helping? Are you facilitating just by participating? That's, that's a, an open question that everybody I think needs to think carefully about. I think we can distinguish um, between you know, hardcore criminal activity, um, which is always going to be going on, um, as it were, on the black, black market, but then also people who might be tempted to engage in some form of tax evasion or arbitrage and try and use the privacy uh, associated with uh, cryptocurrencies to do that. Um, and there, the limitation that people come up with in using these um, is that you're really on your own if you have uh, complete yeah. privacy. If something goes wrong, then you lose everything. Um, and although it's very secure within the uh, blockchain, the point of entry and exit is the weakness. And so you have to have a private key, which is a long thing that you can't remember. So you probably have it written down on a piece of paper or stored somewhere on your computer. And literally somebody could come in and point a gun to your head and say, well, uh, what's your key? Uh, and then take all your, uh, all your, all your crypto assets that way. Uh, and so if you want security against that kind of threat, then you have to uh, have your assets managed by an institution and if the institution is one you're going to trust, it has to be regulated. And if it's regulated, then it has to ask you where you got the money from. So people who don't want to carry that risk of the uh, end, end uh, access uh, security, they then need to come into the umbrella of the regulated system. And so that's one way that we can, uh, we can bring transparency around this. I'm conscious of the time. Um, I think I'd like to bring the discussion to a close. And I'd like us to thank the panel for a really stimulating and thought-provoking conversation. <laughs>